All right, welcome back. So, uh, to pick up where we left off, we just made some good volume changes to kind of uh, even everything out, and we're still working with the same track. A word about which song you select. If you select a song that you're very familiar with for your MIDI import, it's going to do you credit uh, because you'll have you will have a goal in mind as to what type of sound you want to achieve. And again, this is pretty much strictly for practice, so that you can work with your instruments. And you know, the closer you get, and the more time you spend in trying to achieve a sound, it means you're going to be much more experienced with putting these instruments into place when you write your own track. And if you want to go ahead and you know do or follow along in this part with your own track, that's fine. Uh, some of the same guidelines will apply. Uh, one word about um, the flute or any woodwind: a good way to shake it up and add some variety to your flute or your you know whatever uh, type of instrument which would be played by the human lungs. Put it in record mode and play it. Let's get to a part where it's actually playing. Crank this up a bit. So, um, we're going to play it. Let's solo it. A good way to, to give it some variety and make it sound a bit more authentic. Hit the pitch bend. And uh, maybe even like on a rhythm. Just a little bit of a slight tap, or a little wobble. That's what we're going for. It'll look like a bunch of uh, spiky dots and drops, but we want to achieve the effect of you know an, a human being with their limited lung capacity playing. And there's going to be some inaccuracies. Uh, some of those are not very good sounding inaccuracies, but you know, listen to a person who plays a flute or trumpet, and you'll hear that you know they're not always right on pitch. And that's part of the part of the good thing about those instruments, you know, they're not supposed to be. So um, the next step we're going to jump to, and this would be for after you've made all the changes you want to your instruments, and you have good, you have good general sounding instruments. Um, we don't have to worry about the the real specifics yet, um, but you should have a setting which works all the way across your track. All right. If you want to get into automation later for a certain spot, for example, this spot is very busy. I might have to do some specific changes to the mixer just for this region or say for, for this region you'll notice that the piano drops out it's not here and because of that I might have to boost the volume of the flute in order to take up that space All right, to make it sound like the volume didn't drop out on the whole piece All right, I probably won't have a chance to talk about compression in this tutorial but uh, we're going to talk about the way a mastering engineer would look at your track rather listen to your track. So let's hear this. We've got some guitars playing and notice I have two of the same guitars here. One is more the rhythm, one is more the uh, kind of a lead and the way I'm going to separate these I'm going to push one into the background with some reverb and that adds a bit of fullness to it. It fills in the gaps between the strikes and that is going to give it just enough audio space. I'm going to add a little bit of pan to the left and right to kind of separate them. What I mean by audio space here, a mastering engineer thinks in three dimensions. Okay, Your music is not just stereo left and right, but rather it has a height aspect to it, which refers to your high frequencies versus your low frequencies. You know, is it real bass heavy? Is it real um, high frequency heavy? Does it have a lot of, uh, you know, hi-hat sounds or something like that. Um, the stereo effect, we would talk about that, we would say it was a wide sound. Um, that just means that there's a lot of stereo separation between your instruments. If you've got drums on the left ear and you know all the, all the other instruments on the right, you know, you're going to end up with a certain type of mastering. Not, not to say that there's anything wrong with that. It could be the effect that you're looking for, but um, it's just one of those, this is, this is the way we would describe it. Um, the other thing in the third dimension is distance and typically you can achieve distance with a reverb effect That's what I did here with the uh, guitar. I pushed it in, into the background I made it sound as though it was coming from farther away Now your ears will pick that up and your ears will differentiate between a guitar Which is close by and a guitar which is far away go ahead and try it and you'll be uh, you'll be surprised at the type of effect you, you can get out of that so We've got these in place, um, our three dimensions here, distance, um, width, 
which would be left and right, and our height, which we're going to play around with our EQ in just a moment. Now to really get a good idea of the height that we're looking at, I'm doing my vocoder trick again, which consists of placing a vocoder after the mixer and routing only the modulator input from send 4 on my mixer. And I've got them all maxed out. What that does for us, we get real-time frequency data. Okay, now I can see right now that my uh, low mids are pretty well peaked out, even though I've only got two guitars playing. So, um, this is what we're going to do with this part. We're going to try and uh, balance them out. This one's pretty full. And this one's, uh, this one doesn't really need to be changed. I think it's pretty, it does peak every once in a while, and that's fine, but it's not as consistent. This one's pretty heavy all the way across. So, what we're going to do is take Guitar 2 and we're going to EQ it in such a way that we cut out these frequencies. Not cut them out, but rather just, just lower them a little bit. Now, if I do that, my guitars are going to sound pretty similar. Okay? And that was just a demonstration. That's not actually what I want to do here. What I want to do is probably find a range and boost it. Now hear how much the guitar came out just from that little boost? Let's go back and see what we can do wrong here. If I boost the same range of frequencies that the other guitar occupies, we're not going to get quite the same effect. The guitars aren't really going to stand out what you'll have is you'll have a higher degree of competition. One guitar might sound louder than the other, but that's just going to make the other guitar harder to hear. Whereas boosting the frequencies in a different area is going to make them separate. We're going to be able to pick out that guitar much better, much, much easier than the other guitar. Now if you need to make a slight change, you can do it here with the EQ settings here. Um, but these three dimensions combined are, are what you're shooting for. You want to make sure that when you listen to the track, oh, and when you're listening to the track, try and uh, play around with the master volume more than you normally would, and make sure that as you're listening to your track, you can still pick out those instruments, all right, even at a low volume. That's the goal we're going for here. We want to be able to distinguish at any volume setting. We, want, we should be able to distinguish between every instrument that's playing. Now a lot of people will skip this step. The whole mastering aspect of it, it's, it's a really precise field, but if you don't do this step, what you're going to end up with is a song, it's going to sound fantastic on your headphones, but the moment you play it in your buddy's car or on a loudspeaker system, it's going to sound like crap. And the reason is because you didn't go through the mastering step and you've basically just customized your song strictly for your headphones. So, if you have the option to, there are a few things you can do. Try and listen to your song in entirely mono. Um, you know, route everything to one speaker. Um, listen to it on your PC speakers instead of your headphones, or, you know, f switch back and forth between them. Listen to it in, on a recording. You know, burn it to a CD, play it on a iPod, whatever you can. Uh, something like that. Now, um, I don't think I have any time for compression. I can't show you compression in this tutorial. But take a look at this. The one on top is compressed. And if you look at if you look at my DB meters, the right channel, which is the compressed channel, hardly ever moves. And from that you can you can infer what compression really does.